So good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our annual Nadab Robinson Grand Round. Uh, usually we look forward to seeing everyone in person um, here on campus, but the pandemic has actually created new opportunities for us for this particular lecture as well. Um, so without further ado, I will hand it off to Dr. Elaine Lin, who will introduce um, our, our family and today's speaker as well. Thanks, Neil. Good morning, everyone. Um, again, welcome to the third annual Nadav Robinson Grand Rounds. Um, Nadav was a young boy with complex congenital heart disease who I had the honor of taking care of um, a little over four years ago now. Um, to help introduce today's speaker, um, his parents, Tali Medjikovsky and James Robinson, are going to say a few words now. Thanks, Dr. Lynn. Good to see everybody. Hello and welcome. Um, a lot of people have joined us globally on Zoom. Um, Dr. Lynn already introduced, I'm Tali, and this is James, and we're Nadav's parents, and it's been just over four years since he died. Um, I wanted to say a few words about Nadav and our family and why we've asked Dr. Nick Piggott to, to speak with us today. Uh, for those who didn't know him, he was born with his twin at Sinai in 2011, and he was diagnosed by fetal echo at 26 weeks with CHD and heterotaxy in a single ventricle, and he underwent his three life-saving surgeries and several caths there. But he also had a life outside of Sinai. And it was one that took him on trips up and down the East Coast on airplanes to California and Arizona, and later after his Fontan fenestration closure on an odyssey to Sydney, Australia. And during our time there, Nadav met a lot of family and friends. He visited the opera house and saw koalas and kangaroos and also developed a clot in his Fontan circuit a conduit. He was said, I think possibly by Nick, uh, to have been one of the sickest kids to literally walk off the street and into the hospital at Children's Hospital Westmead in Sydney. After a marathon 14 hour surgery, he came out on ECMO, he had a stroke. He contracted aspergillus and developed lymphatic leaks. He spent 82 nights in the PICU at Westmead. And during that time, all of us got to know Dr. Piggott who was the former medical director at the PICU there. Now he's moved on to Children's Hospital Brisbane. That was a desperate time for our family. Nadav was in terrible shape. We had exhausted all medical options that were remaining in Australia and we didn't have a plan. However, looking back now with the benefit of hindsight, we remember this time with gratitude. Dr. Piggott and his PICU team cared for Nadav with kindness, compassion, and sometimes brutal honesty. And because he was the director of the unit, Dr. Piggott was able to do some seemingly audacious things. He took Nadav and his hospital bed on outings outside the ward and indeed outside the building. Nadav visited the pirate ship in the hospital playground and he caressed the leaves and the flowers from the Chinese garden all while being intubated and in his bed. We even went out in the nighttime for stargazing and moon watching, again while intubated and in bed. And much to the chagrin of his future nurses at CHOP, um, Nadav also sucked on ice chips and learned how to speak while being intubated and in his bed. These outings, combined with Dr. Piggott's background in retrieval medicine, helped him guide us on a path to get Nadav back home. And after those 82 nights, Dr. Piggott was able to hand his patient over to the transport team at JOP, uh, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, who I believe are joining us from, um, from Philly today on Zoom and Nadav took his last airplane flights from Sydney to Nadi, Fiji, to Honolulu, to Oakland, California, and finally to Philadelphia on a Gulfstream Three medical air ambulance. During those months in the PICU, Dr. Piggott not only cared for Nadav, but also looked after our whole family. He spent many late nights by the bedside and got to know our other two sons, he even helped us manage our expiring visas with the Department of Immigration, and he held many family meetings. We never had experienced family care as we had with Dr. Piggott at Westmead and for that we will forever be grateful. We asked Dr. Piggott to share his thoughts today and his unique perspective on doctoring patients and families and to speak about how he's able to carry this work out in the high pressure environment of the PICU. Nadav died in 2017. He's left a hole in our family ever since. And between the grief of that and the pandemic, Life this past year has not been easy, but it continues and Nadav remains with us part of our lives through everything we do. One of the aims, with there are several aims, and one of the aims in holding this lecture series is to celebrate his life by bringing people together. So we really are grateful 
that we can host today's Grand Rounds remotely and that Dr. Piggott can join us from Brisbane. We hope to give back to Nadav's medical community by sharing knowledge and that all of us will learn something today. And we also want to touch upon both the clinical side and the human side of medicine during the course of these Grand Round lectures. Dr. Piggott draws upon both these sides of medicine in his practice. And we're very honored that he could be with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tali. And again, thank you, Dr. Piggott, for joining us today from Australia. Um, I am so grateful to you for bringing back Nadav you know, to the US and for allowing me the opportunity to meet Nadav and Tali and James and to have them continue to be in my life. Um, so I'll just do a really quick intro to Dr. Piggott. Um, as mentioned, um, he's a pediatric intensivist um, currently at Queensland Children's Hospital in South Brisbane. Um, prior to that, he was the medical, medical director of the intensive care unit at the Children's Hospital in Westmead for several years. Um, among his many accomplishments as medical director, he significantly expanded the PICU there and established their parent advisory council. Um, Dr. Pickett has also served as a consultant for retrieval medicine um, throughout Australia um, and is a panel member of the New South Wales Pediatric ECMO Retrieval Service. Um, he's spoken in numerous conferences um, and symposia, both in Australia and internationally, um, as well as several TV channels and radio shows. Um, his talk today is titled, Home is Where the Heart Is, and we'll be discussing family-centered care. Elaine, thank you so much. And uh, thank you to the organizers and to Tali and James for inviting me to speak. Uh, this is a real privilege. I don't really recognize the guy you've just described. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I, I always wanted to be a general practitioner. There's no immediate equivalent in the US, but really a family doctor. And I, I haven't managed to achieve that goal yet in my career. I seem to have diverted into pediatric intensive care instead. Um, I've been qualified about 36 years now, so I guess I won't make that particular goal. I've been a pediatric intensive care specialist for a little over 20 years. Um, and I started that off at Great Ormond Street in London as a cardiac intensivist. And then I uh, came back out to Australia. Um, and for eight years, I was the director of the Children's Hospital at Westmead. Um, I'm going to talk about very little in terms of medicine today. Um, and I'd like to share with you some of my thoughts about um, what I think um, matters in some of what we do in medicine today. Um, Tali did make reference to my interest in retrieval medicine. That's been long standing. So I've worked in most subspecialty areas of pediatric intensive care, but I also love doing retrieval medicine. I don't get to do much of it these days. And I mainly, uh, when I do retrieval medicine, I'm doing ECMO. But I think the appeal is um, both a, a love of flying and being an aeroplane nerd, and then also the being in a hostile environment with a critically ill patient where fatigue, um, failing equipment, poor light, noise, are all challenges in being successful challenges that we uh, don't often face in a modern intensive care unit. So that's a little bit about me. Um, Ah, let's see if I can advance my slides. I was uh, in the move from the, the state of New South Wales to Queensland. I've lost access to most of my archive drives. So I actually don't have many photographs to be able to show you today. Um, but I found this yesterday and it's an abstract from a letter that uh, Tali and James wrote to me in September 2006, and I hadn't seen it until yesterday. Um, but I, I looked at this and I, I think it's, it's poignant. Um, so this is a little bit of what I would like to talk about today, about um, clinical expertise, about compassion and communication. So clinical expertise, it's obviously important, but my experience in medicine, and I suspect for most of you, is that we're surrounded by experts. Um, I've never worked in a hospital where I haven't had easy expert access to um, lots of expertise. And paradoxically, clinical expertise is actually the easy part. 
of what we do. And the rest of medicine, the rest of making it effective and compassionate is, is so much harder, it's so much more important, it requires so much more thought. Um, the temptation in medicine is really to prioritize our thoughts around efficacy of treatments, um, but that may happen uh, to the detriment of the quality of quality in human relations. Um, I should say that many of the pictures I've added, uh, I've got in my uh, talk are taken from archives rather than, um, uh, and that reflects me not being able to access my own pictures and I apologize for that. But they convey the important message that I'm trying to project. Compassion. Respectful compassion. I think I can say for almost all the children that we look after in intensive care unit and perhaps in a hospital that families never wished that they were with us in the first place uh, and that they have care, having authority for the care of their children find themselves in a situation where they have to trust us strangers uh, to look after their children and I find that as I go on in my career that uh, this is something I have greater and greater respect for, that it's um, the level of trust that's required in parents and children uh, to allow us to make decisions for them is something that should never be taken for granted. Uh, it's one of the things that encourages me to ask families to um, to tell me about their child, about what they do, about their pets. It's one of the things that encourages me to ask families to print off pictures of their, of their child and to, with the siblings and with the family, um, and to place them around the bed space, space to remind those of us who see the nine-year-old with a head injury in bed 20 um, to be reminded that this is actually this child's life is something very different to what we see in front of it. This, this picture is actually um, of a, a boy called Charlie Gard and his parents. Uh, it was um, a, became a very well known case internationally. This is not a family I looked after. Um, they were at Great Ormond Street long after I left. Um, but perhaps an example of a family who wanted the best for their child, who knew had no ma no background in medicine, and found themselves increasingly in conflict with a team looking after them, providing trying to provide excellent care for their child, tried to act in the child's best interests, uh, and this is an example of something that I think we see occasionally and maybe increasingly in medicine of a breakdown in trust, a breakdown in communication between um, medical teams, clinical teams and families, something that we should try and avoid if at all possible and at all costs. Sometimes it's not possible. Um, we need to remember that families are vulnerable. Families feel guilt. I see this in my everyday practice. I, to give you an example, I was looking after a child last night. I had had an, an open heart operation and it became apparent the next morning that he had possibly had a, a stroke as a complication of the operation. Um, that was pointed out to us by his mother. Um, we, we didn't notice and she, it had been bothering her all night, but finally she plucked up the courage in this morning to say, he doesn't seem to be moving his left side. Um, and is that normal? And when I spoke to her, she said that actually she'd noticed it all night. She hadn't said anything about it. She thought we should have noticed and perhaps she's right. Um, and I have no doubt that she felt guilty about the fact she hadn't raised the alarm earlier. And this is something that imbues um, the complex medicine that we that we do in our day-to-day -day lives. And I think it's important to remember that families carry this burden. I, I, I've chosen this picture 
really is a metaphor it's not it's not intended to be a, a religious message but it is uh, to remind to remind me to remind us about the the power we have to maybe take away some of that burden of guilt um, as as clinicians to actually um, to openly say that the the blame for the situation that families find themselves in doesn't doesn't sit with them that we can share that um, I'm often here about what a terrible working environment we we live in and how hard it is and people fear talk about burnout all the time and uh, fear that this is something that's coming to visit us but showing compassion in what we do is actually part of what potentially nourishes it, nourishes us. This is a um, a photograph of one of our ICU nurses uh, with with one of our patients, and it's certainly my belief that um, being able to share the journey of some of our families. And I don't mean this in a sentimental way, but being able to share part of that journey is part of um, it actually nourishes it. it gives us meaning in what we do that's not to say that we shouldn't be mindful of the well well-being of ourselves and our colleagues um, but we I still feel after all this time very privileged to be allowed to share difficult times with families and I'm sure that's something that that um, most of you feel at times um, I, I, one of my mentors in medicine from many years ago, Jonathan Gillis, an intensivist in Sydney, um, wrote a paper with Janet Rennick, um, Janet Rennick about parental love. And I reread it recently and it's, I feel it's just as true today as it was before. It becomes easy for us to, um, to marginalize parent love, parental love in the busyness and the complexity of modern medicine. Um, and we are, I feel that this is something that's, that's very important to, to make central to the clinical care that we provide in all its elements. I, I, Tali and, uh, and James talked about my enthusiasm for taking patients out of the ICU. I, this is something I've wanted to do for many years. As I've got more senior, it's become easier to do because people are more likely to comply with my requests, my eccentric requests. Um, but a background in retrieval medicine means that the technical side of being able to package children up and take them to different parts of the hospital or outside the hospital, depending on what's available to you, is something that um, I've always enjoyed doing. I've always surprised there seems to be a bit of resistance to it initially either the daily routines too too busy or there are too many complexities or there's um, there's too much risk uh, and I think it's for that reason that I've often been the person who's initiated that because as a relatively senior clinician if things go wrong I can take responsibility for that Sometimes parents are anxious about the prospect of doing this. They will, um, they will not talk about how it's uh, something they desire to do. But in my experience, it's often something that um, people are surprised, embrace with a degree of enthusiasm once they've experienced it. And my intention is always, uh, in the context of a child who's confined to a room or a bed in hospital, is is to make that part of the normal routine, not something that's dependent on having somebody like me involved, but to establish it as something that is that should be achievable, not necessarily every day. It's important to remember that kids, when they're in hospital, are still children, and that where possible, we should be looking at um, encouraging normal activities. Um, I, I'm sure in America, as in Australia, um, the liberation movement for patients has become a bigger and bigger thing. The recognition that an awful lot of, uh, we give a lot of medication 
um, uh, to keep patients in bed and uh, early mobilization is actually very good for children it's good for our patients and it's good for our families um, we need to take every opportunity to embrace normality whatever that may mean and uh, this is something that we can relatively easily do even in quite sick children this is one of the few photographs that I managed to find. This is actually, um, I'm the idiot on the right, in case you um, weren't certain, but this is Nadav. And this is my genius idea to take him out of the intensive care unit, still ventilated, down into the, the gardens at the Children's Hospital at Westmead. You can see he's not even remotely impressed by uh, what we've done in doing this. Uh, he looks nonplussed and I think that's probably because um, it took us too long to actually do this and uh, I think he's wondering why I'm standing there looking so smug and not getting out of the way and letting him look at what's going on. I think the importance of some of this is actually I've no you no unique skills in relation to this um, and actually the important thing is to ensure for us as the clinicians to ensure that this is done safely it's not reckless, but actually it's very easy to do, even in a hospital bed, and um, that we can then step back and um, allow families to actually spend time with their own child without us interfering. And we can just stay in the background, make sure things are safe. And uh, it's possible to go to all sorts of interesting places with children with a wide range of difficult um, and technology dependent conditions. And my experience is that has very rarely been something that um, I've regretted. It's very rarely been something that families have regretted. And it's been, we've increasingly made that part, part of a routine. Sometimes things don't seem to work out the way you expected. This is a, another one of my patients. You can see she's an ICU patient. She's got a vascath sticking out of her neck there. We took her out of the intensive care unit, down to the pirate ship, into the grass, out into the open. We took her along corridors past the, um, the painted cows. All of the things that I would have predicted that she would be interested in. But the thing she was most interested in was when we took her back to the ICU and we took her past a vending machine. And of course, she hadn't been able to eat anything, um, any food from a vending machine anything any of those treats for weeks at that time and she made a stop in front of the machine and just stare at it um, longingly and luckily um, shortly after that we were able to actually provide food that she could eat from it i think it's important in communicating with families to um to talk to recognize hope uh, i'm not talking about being not being realistic but i think as a general principle in in uh, the complex medicine we do helping families to to hope for the best but be prepared for the worst is is just simply us doing our jobs effectively uh, my my partner frequently talks about communicating with intention i think she is implying that that's not something I'm very effective at but it's certainly something I aspire to um, in medicine I frequently see opportunities to communicate with families which are filled with technical detail which are filled with uh, the medical jargon that we always use but where the, the the content the final intention of the conversation is not clear and it's it can be very obvious that families don't really understand what's been said to them and um, you know, as Maya Angelou uh, said people don't remember what you said they will remember how you made them feel and that's a far more sophisticated skill for effective communication in medicine than many people give it credit for this is my new year's resolution every single year and i would say i fail at doing it people um, 
we often say that we have two ears and one mouth and that we should um, speak in, in that ratio. Um, I think it's, it, it's very common um, to not be prepared to take the time to truly listen to families to what they're saying to us and not feel the need to respond to individual things. I did say at the beginning of this that I feel a fraud in doing this because nothing I've said is really more than common sense. Uh, in in communication, be mindful of of um, body language, tone, facial expression, and how those things can be. Uh, we can often behave or look differently to how we feel. This this uh, sculpture was. Um, made by a bereaved father and symbolically shows the, the emptiness inside. Tali and James talked about um, communicating difficult words. Uh, in my experience, the being truthful with families is a uh, is an imperative and that means being willing to talk about difficult things. My practice is um, to always be clear with families that if I think their child, we've gone through a process of aggressive treatment and their child is is dying, that I always tell them that um, honestly. It doesn't mean they have to agree with me and it means that um, I can, it's a way of clearly signaling that um, that they may need to be changed in direction of clinical care. And it allows an opportunity to then signal what's coming next and do that in a compassionate and caring way. Um, I'm an enthusiast for memory making in, in the ICU and that's not just around end of life care. It's around, for me, it's around breaking rules. I'm an enthusiast for trying to bring pets to the ICU, not my pets, but family pets. Um, there are all sorts of rules that make that problematic. Um, I, I have tried to bring a cat into the ICU, but it proved difficult to contain and wasn't entirely successful. Uh, one of the my failures so far is I am still hoping to be able to bring a small horse into the ICU, but I haven't managed to achieve that, that yet and um, I'm not quite sure how to negotiate that in Queensland but we'll see how I progress. So I'm coming to the end of my talk. This is a picture of myself and James Tiley and more importantly in doubt that this is just before he his return journey from Sydney in Australia to CHOP and I've told you that I love flying and I love doing retrieval medicine. So whilst I was absolutely delighted that we were able to get Nadav home, I wasn't part of that journey. I had to wave him goodbye and miss out on the opportunity to travel on a Gulfstream 3. Um, and that as compensation for myself, I tracked the flight on Flight Aware through Midway and Oakland, California and and so on. And slightly strangely, um, and it was a huge relief that the extraordinary retrieval team from CHOP managed to get a, really a very sick boy all the way back to the USA, all the way back home. But strangely, being an airplane nerd, the, that particular airplane that Gulfstream 3, the exact uh, tail number, uh, I get an email probably two or three times a week telling me where it is in the world. And it's not something I actually asked for. And yet somehow I think Nadav is sending me those messages to remind me that actually he managed to get away from us in Sydney and back home to the USA. So that's really all I wanted to say today. Um, I'm not sure I've said anything that will teach any of you anything, but I'm very happy to ask 
answer questions and thank you so much for inviting me to speak.